Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on behalf of the Radiologist Society of Rio de Janeiro and OCAD. I want to welcome and thank you all. My name is Aline Serfari, and I'm here with Dr. Hilary Humans, who coordinates and moderates this series with me. Our guest speakers today are, are Dr. Rower Pedersen, uh, Dr. Guillaume Bierri, and Dr. Paulo Agnolito. This session will focus on sports imaging, and the speakers will present their cases. And at the end, we will have a QA session as usual. If you have any uh, questions at any time during the presentations, please put them in the chat box. And at the end, the speakers will respond to them. The presentations today will be recorded and available on demand on the OCAD website, which is ocadmsk.com, and on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. If you want to join the OCAD community and see challenging cases, consider registering on the OCAD website. Just a quick reminder, uh, attendees have not been given the permission to screen record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. An authorized recording use distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you for your understanding. And with that, I will kick off the session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Roar Pedersen. Uh, he's a Norwegian MSK radiologist. He's head of the MSK imaging in Unilabs, Unilabs Radiology, Norway. He has 20 years of experience as an MSK radiologist and has an extensive experience as a lecturer at national and international courses and conferences. He's one of the founders of the Norwegian uh, MSK Society and it's uh, and his first president. He also runs uh, the Instagram MSK Radiology and oh no, reaching almost uh, 13,000 followers. Please Rower, share your screen. Thank you, and thank you, Aline and, and uh, Hilary, for having me to this amazing series of lectures. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus on the medial part of the knee, a very small area. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, me in the snow uh, right now. Uh, we don't have the temperatures that you may have all over the world. It's uh, kind of freezing in Norway right now. I have a couple of small disclosures, not relevant to this talk, but uh, I'm cooperating with the Collective Minds Radiology and lecturing at the Telemedicine Academy of Barcelona. So let's talk about medial collateral ligament anatomy. I'm sure all of you know this ligament. It's uh, very often injured. It's very often evaluated on all your MRI uh, studies. So it's a slender, thin, black ligament along the medial side of the knee, extending from um, the, the medial uh, condyle of the femur to quite far down on the tibia. It can be defined on axial images and uh, just behind it posteriorly to that ligament will be the posterior oblique ligament and the posterior medial capsule of the knee. I also want to draw your attention to these very small ligaments, the meniscal tibial ligament and the meniscal femoral ligament, seen most often at the medial uh, uh, part of the knee at the, in the midline. So they attach to the meniscus and they can be injured as well as we, can, as we will see in a few minutes. So let's warm up. We have a lot of snow and ski related injuries in Norway. And the next uh, uh, months they will be uh, uh, coming into our clinics and, and uh, presenting findings like this. For instance, on your left side, you can see the bone marrow edema and the soft tissue edema around the knee, but you can also see that the medial collateral ligament has a, most, a small cortical fragment from uh, the femoral condyle displacing it just slightly. On the middle image, you can see the medial collateral ligament as continuous. You see the medial meniscus, the meniscal tibial ligament, but the uh, meniscal femoral ligament is gone. You cannot see it, maybe some small remains here, but mainly edema, soft tissue edema between the 
superficial part and the medial condyle and some bone marrow edema as well. And to the left, this is not a snow injury. This was a martial arts performer who did a high kick and had a valgus injury of the knee. And he has a bone marrow edema in the lateral condyle with a small fracture. On the medial side, there is a rupture of the MCL, the superficial part of the medial collateral ligament, and also thickening and rupture of the medial meniscal femoral ligament. So that's quite kind of common cases in superficial and deep parts of the medial uh, collateral ligament. Then I want to show you three cases. This first one is a 50 year old and it's mainly proton density fat saturated images that I've chosen uh, to show you these injuries. We see parts of the ACL, it was intact, but the PCL, the posterior cruciate ligament is thickened with high signal in the middle part. So it's ruptured. On the medial side, there are bone, uh, so, sorry, soft tissue edema. You can find the medial collateral ligament as continuous. There is edema between the medial collateral ligament and the medial femoral condyle, probably a rupture of the deep part, the meniscal femoral ligament. And there is bone marrow edema at the posterolateral form of the posterolateral part of, of the distal femur. Also, there is a peculiar finding in this area. It seems like the meniscal, uh, the medial uh, collateral ligament continues along the femur. That is not a natural anatomical structure. It wouldn't be the medial collateral ligament attaching so far proximal. Now, this is the periosteum of the medial femur, which has been stripped away from uh, the medial fem uh, femur distally. You can see it even better on this next case. You have to take my word that the medial collateral ligament is intact. This is just one of the slices. And on the adjoining slices, you could find the entire medial collateral ligament. But it's stripped away from its proximal insertion together with the periosteum. And there is fluid and soft tissue edema around that part of the periosteum and also an injury at the proximal end. Again, there is a posterior cruciate ligament uh, rupture, quite clearly seen in the middle part. There is bone marrow edema at the posterolateral part of the femur. And we cannot see the medial meniscal femoral ligament. It's gone as well but the meniscal tibial ligament is intact. Okay, one more case. This is a case who sustained a previous injury to the ACL and the ACL was reconstructed. So we can see the postoperative changes in the tibia. But that, then there was a new injury and we found that the PCL was now ruptured as well. And on the medial side, again, the medial collateral ligament, somewhat thickened, but it's also avulsed from the medial femoral epicondyle together with the proximal uh, periosteum uh, at the medial uh, part of the femur. Again, the medial meniscal femoral ligament is torn. Cannot see any bone marrow edema in that area in this case. So keep that in mind for a while. I guess you all know this injury. This is a bilateral Pellegrini Stida lesion. And Pellegrini Stida, Pellegrini Stida is the name of two Italian guys, I guess. But it denotes a bony uh, protuberance or calcifications at the medial part of the distal femur. In this case, bilateral, but it could be on one side. And traditional, we always thought of this as a chronic injury to the proximal uh, insertion of the MCL with bony changes, scarring of the ligament. In 2009, there was a nice article uh, in skeletal radiology showing a similar bony change on the distal femur. And this was in four cases. 
somewhat more proximal than the expected location of the medial collateral ligament insertion. But it looks kind of similar, just a little bit more cranial to the uh, expected location. And in this article, they showed exactly the same as I've shown you in three previous cases. With a, there was a PCL here, there was an intact medial collateral ligament, but it was stripped away from the femur along with the periosteum. And what they proposed in this article was that, well, you have this injury, there is soft tissue edema, there will be a subperiosteal hematoma beneath that stripped away portion of the periosteum, and then heterotopic ossification as a repair process uh, uh, leading to these changes. So that could explain some of the more proximal uh, Pellegrini Steva lesions. So I read this article in 2009. I thought it was a cool concept and I started looking for it. And I've seen a lot of these cases and we find them in especially ski injuries. injuries. And probably what happens is a valgus injury and a torsion in the knee. It's hard to be quite uh, to be certain of what kind of mechanism that is the reason, but they seem to come together as a footprint like this. So the proximal MCL, it could of course be ruptured or avulsed, but some and sometimes with a bony fragment, but in these cases, it's avulsed in continuity with the periosteum of the distal femur. And we've also found that all of these cases has a rupture of the PCL. We've also found, not described in that article from 2009, that the deep part of the medial collateral ligament is always ruptured, the meniscal femoral ligament. And there is almost always bony edema at the posterolateral part of uh, the femur. So it's kind of a footprint for uh, this injury. Sometimes we see this injury first, and then we, in a way, know that there has to be um, a PCL injury as well. Let me talk just briefly about the medial, the deep part of the medial collateral ligament. There is a meniscal tibial part and there is a meniscal femoral part. And that meniscal femoral part can rupture in isolation. It does not, if it's ruptured in isolation, affect the knee stability, but it may give rise to pain along the medial part of the knee. And that could explain the patient's symptoms even though every other structure is intact. And we see it up in cross-country skiers, downhill skiers, probably mostly after uh, the leg getting caught in the snow, hanging back when you continue forwards and then there is an, a torsion and a, uh, an avul um, a valgus uh, trauma to the knee. The meniscal tibial ligament does not rupture in isolation uh, to the best of my knowledge, but more often together with an extensive medial collateral ligament injury or an ACL injury. If it ruptures and avulses a small bony fragment from the tibia, you could find that small fragment on an ordinary x-ray. That would be sometimes called the reverse second fracture. If you have an avulsion of the meniscal femoral ligament, it could be called the steeda fracture. This is the reverse second fracture. Maybe you can see that small part of uh, uh, the cortex evolves from, from the tibia and bone marrow edema. And of course, these ligaments can tear or rupture at the insertion to the meniscus, either at the meniscal femoral part or the meniscal tibial part. That could explain some of the findings that we may see on ordinary x-rays. For instance, that small reverse second fracture. We could, on both MRI and X-ray see bony fragments in this location, that would be the steeda fracture and avulsion of the meniscal femoral ligament. This, however, is calcific peritendinitis of the medial collateral ligament in about the same location, but more bulky and more uh, lobulated than a small avulsion. And this would be typically at the insertion of the posterior oblique ligament. 
And finally, on your up upper right, a bony protuberance too cranial to be a MCL uh, injury. So this is probably a variant of the Stila Pellegrini may be related to an abosed and stripped away periosteum from the medial collateral, from the medial femoral condyle. So I've tried to describe this peculiar footprint, which we see from time to time with PCL tear, MCL avulsion with periosteal stripping, a deep meniscal um, uh, medial collateral ligament tear or the meniscal femoral tear, and posterolateral bone marrow edema at the LCL origin. If we take a follow-up image of these injuries, they don't usually need any surgery on the medial side of the knee. But then after a while, the stripped periosteum will nicely oppose to the uh, femur again and heal, sometimes just with slight signal changes. And I've also shown you that the tears of the meniscal femoral ligament or the meniscal, uh, these, these small ligaments can tear as well. The meniscal femoral ligament in isolation, but the meniscal tibial ligament usually as a part of a larger injury. And so there are several explanations for those medial knee calcifications that we, we may encounter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Aurora. That was a beautiful review. Um, by the way, fun fact, the voice of Olaf in Frozen is my cousin, Josh Gad. Okay. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Guillaume Berry, who is professor of radiology and director of musculoskeletal radiology at the University Hospital Strasbourg, France, where he attended medical school and received both residency and fellowship training. He did additional residency training at Cochin Hospital in Paris and fellowship training at Harvard Medical School in Boston. He's a member of multiple French and European radiology societies as well as the RSNA and ISS. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's start. Okay, excellent. So uh, it's a real pleasure to to be with you uh, uh, today. Mm. Where is it going? Here it is. So here are my, my disclosures. Uh, let's start with a, a case. So it's the story of um, a 22 year old bodybuilder that felt a pop in the right groin during uh, a 300 pound squat. So an MR was performed, and I propose you to have a look on the axial uh, PD fat set uh, series. Okay, let's now uh, now have a look on the the Corona series. Okay, so before going back to the case, uh, let's have a quick review of the anatomy of the, the quadriceps. As of course you may know. There is four parts of the quadriceps, the vestus intermedius, that's just uh, below uh, on the level of the, the femoral shaft. And on the sides, you have the vastus lateralis and the vastus medialis. And the more interesting uh, part of the quadriceps is, of course, the, the rectus femoris, that is on the anterior aspect of the muscle. And it's um, the more vulnerable to injury, and it is indeed the most commonly injured part of the quadriceps. Uh, probably um, his anatomy explained in a significant part the, the ratio of injury that this muscle can encounter. And let's have a quick review. Um, at the very proximal uh, part in the ascension of the, on the pelvic ring, you have two heads. The first one is a direct head directly on the uh, anterior superior spine and an indirect head, as you can see, 
uh, right here that's running uh, around the uh, acetabulum to insert on the lateral aspect of the acetabulum. And as you can see, this both um, head, of course, going uh, distally and um, uh, things going to be interesting at that level because as you can see here, the direct head um, becomes kind of an anterior fascia or an anterior aponeurosis that covers the anterior aspect of the muscle, while the uh, indirect head, as you can see here, um, go within the tendon, goes within the muscle to form uh, a central or intramuscular tendon, if you like. And this configuration uh, goes on uh, until the, the myth of the muscle, as you can see right here, when the anterior aponeurosis uh, begin to, begins to disappear. And another structure appears at that level. It's um, a posterior fascia. So you see so the anterior aponeurosis is replaced by a posterior fascia, as you can see right here. It goes all along until the very distal part of the muscle, where the posterior fascia form an, an, an individual tendon that kind of blends with the tendon of the three uh, other parts of the muscle. So as I told you, the rectus femoris is the most commonly injured part of the quadriceps. And within this muscle, there are uh, areas that are more uh, vulnerable than the others. And as you may know, the most uh, commonly injured part of the muscle is the mid part here, as you can see at the level of this central tendon. The distal part is uh, the second part that's more injured, uh, while the proximal part is um, less commonly injured. And sometimes the diagnosis of this area is quite difficult to assess because uh, I think we're not very that familiar with the anatomy of this area. So let's have a quick look at the normal anatomy of this proximal insertion of the rectus femoris. Uh, let's have a look on those axial uh, slides. Oh, it's not showing, okay, no problem, let's run it. So as you can see, it's going quite a bit rapidly. You have the direct tendon right here on the, the spine, the anterior spine, and the indirect tendon that's inserting uh, on the lateral aspect of the acetabulum. And you can see here, both tendon going distally and blend for a moment. Then you can see the indirect is gonna move uh, anteriorly on the anterior aspect of the muscle body to form, as we saw just before, this uh, anterior aponeurosis. And at the opposite, the indirect tendon, you see, remains on the medial aspect of the muscle and then uh, goes within the muscle body, as you can see right here, why the direct tendon form ob an obvious uh, membrane right here. So there are two different components of the anterior, of the tendinous anterior aspect of the muscle. The direct tendon that forms an aponeurosis and the indirect tendon that, after a twisting uh, motion, forms the central or intramuscular uh, tendon. So two different configurations, and we're going to see that the pattern of injury are going to be very dif um, different depending on the um, structure that is injured. So let's go back to our case. Um, so let's see the axials. Um, once again, we saw the direct tendon right on the uh, iliac spine, as you can see here, and the indirect on the lateral aspect of the acetabulum. Okay, let's go now. Uh, you can see here there is um, fluid and eye signal area surrounding those two those two tendons. Once again, we nicely identify the direct tendon right here and the indirect uh, head right here. Let's go back. You can see that at level the indirect head is still nicely visible, but we should see something here. And obviously, uh, the direct head is not uh, seen anymore, not visible anymore. Let's go even um, further, as you can see right here. This is the indirect head that becomes at that level, uh, as you can see, an intramuscular or a central tendon. And the aponeurosis is not seen anymore. So this is a severe uh, MTA, so myotendinous injury at the level of the anterior aponeurosis. Just, just a quick, quick reminder of what we just saw before, the normal anatomy of this area. As you can see the eye direct uh, head forming this intramuscular tendon, as you can see right here. But all this anterior aponeurosis, as you sh we should normally see at the anterior aspect of the muscle, has completely disappeared. Right here, there's nothing left to, uh, to see. So there is uh, an obvious rupture of the direct head and a several uh, MIT of the anterior aponeurosis. So we have both components, and we're going to see that it's a major uh, aspect of the, prog of the prognosis. 
On the uh, coronal um, MRI image, we can see an extensive edema along the, the cordyceps muscle, along the um, medial aspect, oh, sorry, a lateral aspect of the vestus medialis. And this is the landmark of those uh, of this uh, myotendinous injury at the aspect of the, the medial aspect of the rectus femoris. And we, when we go even um, backward doing the uh, uh, the slides just behind the, the one we saw, as you can see right here, there is an obvious uh, interruption. There's a rupture of the direct uh, head of the rectus femoris. So uh, we have an obvious damage to the connective tissue, the supportive tissue, and this is so-called an high-grade MTI. And so the diagnosis is quite poor with a, a return to play that is over 12 weeks. So the crucial point uh, when you're dealing with an MTA it's to identify an injury to the connective tissue. And this is the main prognosis factor of the uh, time to play, return time to play. So when you're a corresponding physician or if you're working with um, athletes, the main information you have to give in your report is uh, the presence or not of uh, an injury to the connective tissue. A uh, quick review about the uh, um, mechanism of injury of the, the quadriceps. You probably know that there is two types of motions uh, for uh, a defined muscle. The most common one is the and the, the better known uh, motion is, of course, the concentric motion. That is a, um, a motion where the tendon shortens. So the action happens when the tendon and the muscle shortens. And most of the injury is going to occur uh, not during the concentric motion, but uh, during a so-called eccentric uh, motion. Uh, this is the moment when the muscle contracts while it's lengthening. So it's kind of strange um, situation, but it's a, a mechanism that is used to restrain motion when you have to um, relax, uh, not um, restrain the motion and not to, to, um, to reduce speed, for example, or to uh, um, wrestle with gravity or stuff like that. And it's very, very uh, strainful for stressful for, for the muscle. So most of quadriceps injury and most of hamstring injury, it's exactly the same occur during an eccentric mechanism. So this is the moment when the, the athletes start to um, slow down and stop uh, his run or his squat or whatever motion. We're going to see an example of these um, athletes, as you can see right here, and have a close look to the motion of the of this um, of this young guy. He first going to go down and try to squat. So you can see he's gonna push, he's gonna push for, for a moment and then it stops. And as you can see, we're gonna have a look and uh, probably a loop um, on this sequence. As you, you're gonna see that he stops and then the injury occur. The injury is not occurring while he's pushing. The injury occur when he made that little stop. I'm sorry, it's not working. <laughs> Here it is. So he's pushing, he stops, and you see the injury occur at that moment. Show you once again, because it's, here it's concentric and then it's eccentric, you know? He's trying to retrain the motion. It's not possible to push anymore. It's retraining the motion, going back, and tuck the injury occur at that level. It's very, very common. It's when you go deeper to the history of uh, the injury of the athletes, that is very the, the most commonly encountered uh, mechanism of injury. Let's have uh, to finish. Uh, a look on the companion case. So this is a story of a 25 year old soccer player uh, that felt an anterior uh, pain on the mid side uh, after shooting into the ground. So now he missed the ball and he shoot into the ground. So just have a look, it's contracting and then there is uh, something that's blocking his, um, his, his, uh, his foot. The foot is not able to, uh, to go further. So it's exactly the equivalent of an eccentric contraction. So let's have a look on the uh, MR. We have here an actual um, PD fat sets with uh, control lateral control. As you may have recognized, of course, there is an injury here uh, around the central tendon. You see this edema surrounding the central tendon, but so this is a, a, a mighty of the central tendon, but as you can see, uh, on the on the coronal, uh, I will show you in a moment. The conjunctive remain intact, and obviously the this uh, injury to the central tendon, the MIT of the central tendon, is the most common uh, injury of the rectus femoris. And the, probably the um, the easiest way to recognize this is to identify this bull's eye sign. Uh, 
with the tendon, uh, the intact tendon surrounding by the edema. And as you will see on this coronal view that uh, the connective tissue is obviously intact, so it's uh, a better prognosis, prognosis than uh, the case of the patient we just saw uh, before. So keep in mind this injury to the central tendon, it's a, a very, con very, very common. Uh, just for, uh, for instance, an example, um, sometimes you can have um, an hemorrhage or a very large hematoma at that level. That could be a misdiagnosis for a tumor. So be very uh, careful when you see something in this area. It's most of the case, it's an, it's an MIT. So uh, to sum up this um, short lecture, um, keep in mind that the rectus femoris is uh, far, far from the other, the most commonly injured part of, of the quadriceps. And uh, the proximalization is made by two heads or two, two tendons that is very uh, easy to identify when you get the anatomy in, in mind. The proximal tear is quite uncommon. It's uh, of poor prognosis. We have to look at it very, very carefully. We're dealing with patient with a, a growing pain. Uh, of course, the most common site of injury is the sexual tendon. And uh, the last thing I like to to emphasize is that the prognosis of such injury depends on the involvement or not of the connective tissue. And this is the crucial point you have to put in your report. And that being said, I really thank you for uh, first your attention and second for the uh, nice invitation. Thanks. Thank you too. Beautiful presentation. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paulo Agnolito, he's a Brazilian MSK radiologist practicing both in a private clinic and in, in the university hospital. He has um, 10 years of experience as an MSK radiologist and has uh, extensive experience as a lecturer at national courses and conferences. He also runs the profile Dr. Lito and MSK.radiology on Instagram along with another profile on YouTube called Dr. Lito, reaching together almost 13,000 followers. Please, Paulo, share your screen. Thank you, Aline. Uh, can you see my... Yeah, but it's not in presenter mode. Now it's... Now it okay. Uh, so thank you. Uh, just a minute. I'd like to thank the invitation for it's a pleasure to be here with, alongside such brilliant uh, MSK radiologists. I'd like to firstly apologize for my English. I think it's a little bit rusty, but I'll do my best. Uh, and today I'll, I have no conflict of interest in this presentation. And today I'll be presenting the case of a 30 years old uh, old female, previously sedentary and overweight with a BMI of 29.3. 29 uh, she decided to start practicing beach tennis for approximately three months in order to lose weight. During a, tra a training set with her coach, she experienced excruciating pain on her, her uh, right knee after a fall during a drill exercise. She was then unable to, unable to stand up alone and to bear weight on the affected lower limb. Uh, her past medical history was unremarkable, except for uh, joint hypermobility. She was, she was able to perform this common maneuver with both her wrists. Uh, she was brought to a small ER in a small town close to Ribeirão Preto, and a uh, Physical examination was limited due to pure, uh, periarticular edema, severe joint pain associated with signs of effusion, and at this point she had no peripheral neurovascular uh, alterations. There is a history of x-rays being made at this moment, but they were not available when I first uh, got in contact with this case. She was then... Uh, Afraid after initial maneuvers to stabilize their articulation and to control pain. She was referred to an orthopedic service here in Ribeirão Preto for further evaluation and management. And then she was submitted to new x-rays and to MRI evaluation of her knee. And that's when I get in case and get in contact with this case. I was the radiologist reported, reporting these examinations and now I will present them to you. 
the x-rays uh, that I first got in contact was this, the anterior, posterior, and lateral incidences of the right knee. Uh, and the most important find here is an avulsion fracture F of the fibular head. Can you see my uh, mouse? Let me Yes, we can see. Uh, okay, of the fibular head. And here in a zoom, there is a, a arcuated sign pointed by the yellow arrows, a finding that you know, uh, that indicates posterolateral complex injury and also has high association with ACL tears. So the MRI that she was submitted, here's the coronal T2 spare image. It shows uh, soft tissue edema, bone contusions, and posterolateral complex injury, including complex avulsion of the biceps tendon and the lateral collateral ligaments. I will show uh, some highlights of the this video if it's too fast. Uh, that's the uh, avulsion fracture of the fibular head, as we could see um, on her x-ray. Uh, the sagittal T2 images I'll show now. It shows a complete tear of both anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments alongside the findings that we already saw in the coronal plane. Here are the highlights of the sagittal plane. So uh, the blue arrows point to a complete tear of the ACL. The green arrows indicate a complete tear of the posterior cruciate ligament, and the yellow circle indicates the evolution fracture of the fibular head, our arcuated sign. So that's the axial T2 MRI images, and they demonstrate uh, all the previous finding. And one major concern in complex lesions of the knee is neurovascular injury, especially those of the common fibular nerve when the posterior lateral complex is involved. Uh, so in the red arrow, we can see the common fibular nerve and uh, there is no alterations of signal intensity or thickness of the nerve alongside all the uh, parts that we could see in this exam. So the T2 image acquired only in sagittal plane showed no other signs of fracture except of the fibular head. So at this point, my diagnosis was multiligamentous injuries of the knee, including posterior lateral complex grade three lesion, the ACL grade three lesion, the PCL grade three lesion, alongside with joint effusion, bone contusions, and soft tissue edema. And adding up all this lesion, I was confident that the patient experienced a knee dislocation episode. I tried to get in contact with the ER that firstly attended the patient, and I was able to contact a fellow colleague that worked there, and he was able to recover the x-ray that was made. And they indeed showed a neat dislocation and nice and shown here in these images alongside with our fibular head avulsion fracture. So this was in fact a neat dislocation. Uh, now, I will revise some key aspect of this case. So the first key aspect of this case is the acquitted sign. It's best demonstrated at standard anterior posterior radiographs of the knee. It's a avulsion fracture of the fibular head at the insertion of the acquitted ligament complex. It's a sign of injury of the posterior lateral corner, especially uh, the biceps tendon and or the lateral collateral ligaments, they insert right here at this uh, topography. And the importance of this sign is that it's associated with anterior cruciate ligament injury in approximately 9% of the cases. Uh, the posterior lateral uh, complex mechanism of injury is exactly the same of the posterior cruciate ligament, including a direct blow into a tibia in a semi-flected knee, as shown in these uh, pictures. This is common in car accidents and or uh, a hyperextension of the knee. This mechanism lead, uh, led to lesion of the posterior lateral corner structure and of the posterior cruciate ligament. 
So uh, the second key aspect of this case is uh, knee dislocation. They are limb threatening uh, injuries. The widespread concept is that knee dislocations are associated with high energy traumatic injuries. But uh, about 40% of these injuries can occur through low energy mechanism, and this is more common in women and people with obesity. Uh, there are several classifications addressing this topic. The most common and most uh, used is the Schenck classification. It's an uh, anatomical classification base, uh, based on ligamentous damage. There are, uh, it includes five grades of lesion with KD standing for knee dislocation and the letter M or L standing for medial or lateral collateral ligaments lesions in association. Our patient was classified in the KD3L, which stands for dislocation, include disruption of both those cruciate ligaments associated with lesions of the lateral collateral ligament or the lateral uh, posterior lateral complex. So about neurovascular inju injuries, one major concern in this clinical setting is neurovascular injuries. And the table shown that the incidence of those lesions according the, to the chain classification. It's important to remain that the grade three, especially the 3L, has high association with neurovascular injuries, especially of those of the common fibular nerve. Uh, lastly, I would like to uh, revise this another key aspect of this case that is the ligamentous injury classification. There are several classifications, and the most common, most widespread acceptance is the grade three system, which includes the grade one, that's also known as a sprain, and it's a uh, high signal, a high signal adjacent to the ligament, which looks normal. The substance itself looks normal. And the grade two, it's also known at, as a partial tear. It's high signal adjacent to the ligament associated with high signal and or a partial disruption of the ligament fiber itself. itself. And the grade three, also known as a complete tear of the ligament, is uh, the complete disruption of the ligament fibers. Uh, this classification system also has an important role to direct clinical decision as grade one and grade two uh, lesions tend to be approached clinically with uh, PT and non sternal uh, anti-inflammatories. And grade three, the complete tier tends to be approached surgically, but it depends on the patient profile. Our patient in this case was approached surgically which posterior cruciate ligament reconstruction associated with posterior lateral corner transosseous suture. And this all was stabilized with sternal fixator for the first two weeks. Here is the follow-up radiographers. Three months after the initial surgery, the patient was doing fine in PT sessions. And she was scheduled for an ACL reconstruction after six months of the first surgery. So my take point, take home points in this presentation is that sports related injuries are common and among the most prevalent MSK injuries, especially in young patients. Knee dislocations can occur with low energy mechanism, uh, especially in women and obese population. And this was uh, also uh, new to me. Uh, our graded sign must prompt MRI evaluation of the knee in order to rule out major ligamentous injuries and neurovascular injuries is a major concern in this clinical setting. Sorry for the typo. This was my uh, reference in this presentation and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so there's one question here in the chat and it's for Dr. Viri. Guillaume, um, I know you, you've already answered, but I'm not sure if everyone read it. So I'll ask the question again. Um, let me find, so it's from Mohamed Gassed. He's from Algeria and his question is 
for you, Guillaume, why you mm -hmm. did not show ultrasound imaging. Ultrasound can be very easy and quick to fix the diagnosis. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, ultrasound is a very convenient uh, modality for uh, the diagnosis of, uh, of uh, muscular tendinous injury and muscular injury uh, in general. Um, actually, uh, this patient was uh, an elite uh, soccer player, and so ultrasound was not made. Uh, we put directly the patient in the MR because the staff was very worried about the time to return to play and to a better assessment of the conjective tissue uh, involvement. We rather do MR than ultrasound. Uh, indeed, if you are skilled with the, this modality, the diagnosis of the uh, injury to the conjective tissue is not difficult at all, but it's not possible to to be done by every radiologist. And moreover, most of surgeons don't uh, believe you when you show uh, ultrasound images. Uh, are they rather more confident while reading by themselves the MR images? So in most of the case, when you're dealing with all kind of uh, sports guy, but most of all with the athletes or player, you have to you have to do anymore. It's very more convenient and easier to read for the the surgeon and the clinicians. Okay, excellent. So Guillaume, I'm curious to know if you use any of the classification uh, systems uh, to classify muscle injuries in your practice. No, I I, I don't use it anymore because it's too complex too difficult it's not it's difficult to reproduce uh we try we try with you know the colleagues and it's it's never the same never the same type so i i i escape on um are we dealing with a strictly muscular injury or does the connective tissue involve as well and i only put that in the report uh, telling the the clinician the staff or the surgeon okay it's only muscular so it's you know what's really de dealing with a fully muscular injury so a very mild or minimum um, injury. We are probably dealing with a return to play uh, less than six weeks. But as soon as the convic convective tissue is involved, you're dealing with six to 10 to 12 uh, weeks. So the only relevant, in my view, uh, relevant information is just to assess if the convective tissue is, uh, is injured or not. And it's quite difficult to find this information in the current literature or current classifications. So I dropped the classification and I only remain of this main information about, as I told you, are we dealing with a strictly muscular or injury or does the connective tissue uh, involved as well? Okay, thank you. I have a, I have a question for Roar. Um, when you were presenting the cases, um, it struck me how similar it was to the reverse, reverse second, um injury and, and you described that in detail. You know, a long time ago when I, I researched uh, reverse second injury, there were very few reported cases. Do you have a sense of, uh, you know, whether whether this variant on the femoral side is as uh, rare or not, or if clinically they um, do any better or worse? Yeah, uh, so what you're asking is, is the meniscal femoral injury more often seen than the meniscal tibial injury? Uh, or the steeda fracture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I mean, because we, they both seem to be associated with the PCL uh, tear. I mean, it, it it seems to just be a mirror image kind of a thing. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not sure if I got that question. Uh, uh, did you, uh, Hillary? Did you mean the? The uh, regular second fracture or the no reverse reverse second fracture. Yeah, the again. reverse. Okay. Well, I don't have many cases of the reverse second fracture. Only a few. Maybe we overlook them, but uh, they are overshadowed by the meniscal femoral injury and uh, what I presented here. And the ordinary second fracture is, of course, very commonly seen uh, in association with the uh, posterior cruciate ligament injury. So I, I guess I have three or four cases of a reverse second fracture. I don't have any more than that. I don't see it too often. And, and your injuries are mostly snow injuries. Yeah, it would be uh, things like snow, you know, going downhill skiing, cross country in, uh, in, uh, in uh, certain uh, snow and frost conditions, water skiing, martial arts, uh, kicking injuries. 
they are uh, that's the type of injury uh, type of sports where I see these injuries. Thank you. But what I can add to that, Hilary, uh, I've asked many colleagues, what do you think is the uh, type of uh, movement that you have to perform to get this injury? Uh, and I haven't received any good answers yet because it, it is a footprint. It's obviously a footprint of some typical uh, injury, but the exact nature of it uh, cannot be, I, I don't know yet. Thank you. I have a. I have. I'm curious about something here. Um, it's the questions for you, Guillaume. Uh, is it, do you think it's useful to measure uh, the extent of muscle injury in terms of prognosis or not? No, no. It it doesn't change anything. Um, the only one thing that is relevant is to assess if there is an, an hematoma or not. Uh, and this is quite correlated with the extent of injury, of course. If you're dealing with a very small injury, there's no significant uh, hematoma. But as soon as you saw, as you see, sorry, uh, an hematoma, you have to to puncture it because it's gonna help the healing of the injury and really fastens uh, the recovery of the patient if you if you puncture and evacuate it. So most more, this is more important than measuring the uh, the extent of the of the trauma. Okay, I don't see any other question here. Hillary, do you have any questions? Uh, it looks like there's, well, I don't know. Nope, that's it. Nope. Okay, so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we'll take a short break in January and we'll resume our activities in February. So thank you and see you all in February. Mm -hmm.